there are lots of different materials that implants are made out of. Usually they're either metal or some form of composite like a ceramic or plastic, some form of plastic polymer. So in general it will be a metal, a plastic polymer or a composite of some kind. And there are loads of different compounds out there that are some are like patented, some we are working on are subject to patent, some are already out there in the world. There's also coatings that you put on these implants to help bone grow into them. And there are plastics that you can put in the joint that cartilage can rub against and not get damaged. So right now there's a, a complete revolution, a volcanic eruption of possibility with regard to the biomaterials that are available to us. And it's a hugely exciting time to be a surgeon. We have access to more than we ever had before and we, we know what indications to put them in and things are advancing very, very rapidly. And we have the measurement tools to say, let's say we put a specific plastic inside a joint. In the case of cartilage replacement, uh, that's a polyurethane replacement. Then we can do an MRI scan to see how the joint is, is responding to that, which is great. Stick the dog in the scanner, see how it's doing, happy days. And we can do a lot more now than we ever have done before. It's, it's a convergence of engineering and biology. It's amazing. Fundamentally, you load your body by walking. Therefore, every implant that you put in the body has to respond to that load, and the bone needs to remodel around the implant. So everything that we put into dogs and cats nowadays has to look at the impact that that loading will have on the metal and how the metal will transfer that load to the bone and not fracture or splinter it or come apart. And dozens and dozens and dozens of research projects worldwide are going into getting metal which is more like the characteristics of bone. So in other words, when you put pressure on bone, there's a little bit of give in it, a little bit. Um, that's called compliance, a little bit of give. And if you can make a compliant material that, that moves a little bit, but not too much, that's quite good. Um, the other thing that you want is stress, sh the other thing you don't want is stress shielding. So if you have a piece of metal sticking out of my arm, and I'm going to walk on it because I'm a dog, then the metal will break off here or the bone will break off here because the metal might be much stronger than the bone or vice versa. So stress shielding that's called where there's a, a shielding effect here and the stress isn't transmitted. So a lot of the times we try and make metal that will, the bone will grow onto. And sometimes we use a beaded surface that's like a honeycomb, like the bone marrow. And sometimes we'll use compounds like hydroxyapatite, which is a chemical that makes the bone grow onto the metal. Um, but there's loads and loads of different techniques, trabecular metal, porous metal, and chemicals that will help the bone to bond with the metal. I think to be a surgeon you need to have an ego because otherwise you couldn't go into theatre. But I think if your ego supersedes the humility that biology will subject you to, then you've lost the plot because there's no surgeon in the world good enough, the biology will not humble you. So every day I go in with a certain temerity into theatre and think, well, today I could mess up, or today biology could mess with me. Is there anybody that I look up to? Sure, there are loads and loads of people that have influenced me in my career, geniuses, way, 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 way more clever than I am, who are engineers, biologists. Um, to give you two examples, I met Lord Attenborough recently, uh, who was, was discussing how he, he grew up in, in television and, and how in the 60s they hadn't really got sound and television mixed together and it was amazing and he gave this paradigm about he was filming a, a bird of paradise displaying in some jungle in Madagascar and the guy couldn't do the sound at the same time as the vision so they filmed this bird but the, every time they turned on the camera it sounded like a cement mixer going so they couldn't record the bird because it was a separate machine. So they came back to London and they had like 15 hours of the Bird of Paradise display, which was the first time it had ever been filmed, and five and a half seconds of uh, 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 
which was the sound that the bird of paradise made. So they had to loop this sound onto the vision, and then they displayed it to the BBC. And Attenborough's mentor wrote to him, and he, and he said, My dear fellow Attenborough, I was incredibly impressed by your, your video of the birds of paradise displaying, but I, I noticed an incredible thing, my dear chap. Uh, the bird of paradise only has four syllables. Uh, 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 uh. You should write a paper on it. So his mentor was telling him to write a paper on something that was completely wrong. Why do I tell you that? It made me laugh because a lot of times in science we think we're right. We might be completely wrong. Why is that important? Never, ever, 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 ever think you're right. Because you're probably not. And in 10 years time, everything we know now will be obsolete anyway. anyway. So when people say pioneer this, blah, 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 well, in 10 years time I could be dead. Or everything I've done now is obsolete. So there are loads of people that have influenced me, surgeons and otherwise. A, a, a very brilliant veterinary surgeon called Dr. Marvin Olmsted at the University of Ohio, who taught me how to do total hip replacements, picked up the cup of a total hip in his finger, and historically, this cup thing had to be put in with, it's not that I have all of these props, it's just, this is my consulting room, this is not set up. Um, I have these to show clients. So people would take this cup and put it in the hip in a very specific way to uh, try and mirror the, uh, the normal cup. So here's a, an arthritic cup here and they would put it in there and they would have to orientate it in a very specific way. And it, I saw people take hours to do this. This guy, Professor Marvin Olmstead, picked it up on his finger like this, didn't let it fall like I just did, picked it up on his finger and did that, and just held it there as a cement set. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. How did he know exactly where that cup was supposed to go? in three dimensions. And how he knew was very simple. He knew anatomy like the back of his hand. So I determined from that day forth to learn anatomy like the back of my hand so that I would know the way around the body with millimeter precision. So you know where everything is all of the time. People forget that a whole team of people developed these things. Professor Gordon Blond at University College London is one of the brightest men I've ever met. He discovered how deer antler attaches to skin and therefore made a metal that skin attaches to. That's his work, it's not my work. I just happen to be the first person to put it in a, a walking patient. I'm just the carpenter. He made the tools. So I think that, you know, I would like to think of myself as a biological artist. We go into theatre and we create uh, the best art we can by, by using our tools for the benefit of the patient, but there's way more bright people than me out there and some of them I'm lucky enough to train now and they're the future. My only legacy will be the people that, that I train and what they will bring to the world and the patients that I treat and what joy they'll bring back to their families, that's it.